So let's get into it. So we start off with Southampton nil, Manchester United three. Goals from Matthias De Ligt, Marcus Rashford, and Alejandro Garnacho. There was also a red card in this game for Jack Stevens of Southampton. So starting from a Southampton perspective, I mean, yeah, this was this was really a sort of I guess harsh reality of the Premier League. Um, because they've, in their other games, I feel like, you know, they didn't necessarily play amazing, um, and sort of deserve to lose most of their games besides the Newcastle one. This one, they, for the first, like, 20, 25 minutes, played really well. They played really, really well, had some good chances. United didn't really do too much, and Southampton looked really good. They then get a penalty. was actually around the 26th, 25th minute or something like that. And weirdly, Cameron Archer takes it. Um, I believe they said, like, I think it was on match of the day or something, that it's the first penalty he's ever taken in his career. Meanwhile, Ben Brote and Diaz was on the pitch and he scored like nine penalties in his career. He takes Onana saves, credit to Onana, good save. Um, and then suddenly from that moment, Southampton sort of collapsed and moments after Matthias to let down the other end scores and it's like yeah that's that's kind of a Premier League in a nutshell when you're playing these big six sides you have to score when you're on top you have to score um, when you're dominating controlling games because games can just ever ever flow very very easily in the Premier League and teams you know with the quality when you're playing a Man United the quality they have to to score can come and it can easily score if you if you don't take your chances now what i will say is i don't actually know what on earth happened in terms of mentality this was a bit concerning in terms of after that miss penalty him and after you know it's called their first goal southampton just completely collapsed like literally i don't remember southampton doing anything after that moment don't remember them doing much going forward at all um, and defensively, you know, might not be great the game and dominate your proceedings. So that's a bit concerning if you're a Southampton fan, the way they just completely collapsed. And yeah, another loss more. I think they are on zero points, aren't they? Not good for them. For United, though, this is a huge win and it was much, much needed. After that loss uh, before the international break to Liverpool, you know, people talking about United, people talking about Den Haag again all this negativity around them yet again and you're like okay going away to Southampton you really need to be winning this and in style and they did so got the job done but Thomas De Ligt scoring his first goal is also a nice bonus particularly though Marcus Rashford scoring I thought was really really good for them and for him personally because he's not had the best start of the season he didn't have the best uh, season last year either come under quite a bit of criticism, I remember getting him, I remember him getting booed in the Liverpool game by United fans, some of them, so to get himself a goal, it was a good goal as well, really, really good for his confidence, and let's see if he can uh, kick on from there, and yeah, um, Casemiro was dropped as well, Garte came off the bench, uh, but you know, the game was pretty much done by then, I was really surprised to see Ericsson play though, because you know, I feel like, you know, we were trying to get rid of him. He was kind of out in the dark and then suddenly came in beside. But yeah, overall, it was a much needed win from Manchester United. And yeah, kind of back on track for them. Next up, we have Brighton nil, Ipswich nil. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the first nil nil of the season because I don't remember. This is the first nil nil of the season. Um, but I, I I think this game deserved to go off. There was plenty of chances, particularly Brighton. I thought Brighton were by far the better team. By far the better team. Brighton had lots of possession, as you can see, lots of chances created, but they just really couldn't finish. They didn't have their finishing boots on. Maybe that's because, you know, Joao Pedro wasn't there. He um, was injured for this game. But yeah, you know, Midoma had a great chance. Minda had a good effort, Rutter had a good effort, credit to Murich, though Murich pulled off some really good saves, you know, hasn't had the best 
messed up the life that him switch um we had a couple errors but this is a great game for him we got a clean sheet as well but yeah look for brighton it was it was actually a pretty good performance to be honest uh like i said look at the stats there you know 21 shots 68 percent possession lots of chances but defensively weren't really in any danger of conceding like if she had a couple counter attacks that was really it um so even though we didn't get the result they didn't lose and i think the performance in general was encouraging from brighton and nothing really to worry about also evan ferguson got some minutes which is really surprising to see i completely forgot about him uh but yeah we'll see if he gets into the fold as for ipswich this is an amazing result this is an absolutely fantastic result for Ipswich. We've seen what Brighton have done this season so far. They've beaten United, they've drawn to Arsenal. They're, they're a very good side, they're a very, very good team. Going away to Brighton is not easy. And even if you were probably, you know, you had to ride your luck, you got the point. And this is a great point away from home against Brighton. You know, they dug in very well. Um, defended very deep, defended well. I thought Hutchinson and Delap, you know, they had to work off scraps, but they did really well with, you know, getting the ball and bringing Ipswich up the pitch. But yeah, Ipswich, really good result for them. Brighton, good performance. Disappointing, couldn't get the win. Next up, we have Crystal Palace 2, Leicester City 2. Two goals from Sean Philippe Medetta, goal from Jimmy Vardy, and a goal from Stevi Mavadi. Yeah, this was um, this was an interesting one. Another another comeback from a team uh, from two goals down. Leicester went two 0 up, and Palace brought it back to two all. From a Palace perspective, I mean, I would have really mixed emotions. I'm not sure how you would feel about this because realistically, if I told you before the game, Leicester at home you're gonna draw two two, you would probably be quite disappointed. Leicester at home is a game you would really want to win. But then, given the fact you were two 0 down, you're like, okay, uh, I'm actually happy with a point. Um, but I did think Palace were the better team in general, anyway. Um, and I mean, for the goals, like particularly the first one, Dean Henderson, an absolute horror show. I don't know what on earth he was doing there. Second goal as well, another sort of individual error in a way. Maxine Lacroix made his debut. Celebration. 
let's try and make it nil nil for as long as possible and then towards the second half let's go for it let's let's put on our more dynamic guys who can hit them on a counter puts on our Sonadoy puts on our anger and then what happens they both combine for the goal absolutely superb superb stuff Sonadoy what a goal as well what a fantastic goal curls it beautifully into the corner um, and yeah this is a historic win for Forrest and look I'm not gonna say I expected this but I'm pretty sure in my last game week review I've said this about Forrest that on the counter attacks they look really good and they're gonna cause big six sides problem this season don't be surprised if this is not the only team this the only big six side that loses to Forrest this year because on the counter attack with Hudson Adoy with an Alanka um you know with all I know buying for the back Morgan gives why playing the balls they are lethal and one of the best in the league at doing so so yeah huge huge credit to Forrest what a, what a victory for them now as for Liverpool as for Liverpool well 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 the Arnie slot honeymoon is officially over and uh yeah I guess this was a welcome to the Premier League for Arnie slot because you know they Liverpool were bought Liverpool really bought and I'm not going to say like again I'm going to say oh this was coming but their performances at the start of the season have been good they've been really good but they've not been like flawless if you get what I mean in the Ipswich game you know the first half they were pretty bad second half great against Brentford uh you know they scored their two goals and after that didn't really do too much against United you know, they really gifted most of the goals to them. Now again, I'm not I'm not trying to discredit their whole team and their wins or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, people are like, oh my god, everything's perfect. Not really. And you could see that they were struggling a little bit in terms of uh, breaking down low blocks. And I think that is what we saw here. Where someone puts in a really rigid low block system and Liverpool just pass the ball way too slow I, I mentioned this before I mentioned this in a couple of my reviews that they've been passing really slow and you know there have been moments where they speed it up and it looks really good but in this game they just couldn't do it they couldn't do it Mo Salah was absolutely abysmal in this game the substitutes came on and were rubbish as well Darwin Nunes Gagbo did nothing and it was just awful it was awful from Liverpool um literally created barely anything had a couple chances here and there but they were really half chances nothing like clear cut and yet um it's nothing to panic about or anything but i think it's just a bit of a reality check i would say for liverpool and arnie slot but okay just a reminder this is a bit of a transitional season and this is going to take time to learn how we play under him and get everything right and games like this might happen but yeah um no, not not a good result okay next up we have manchester city to brentford one two goals from erling Haaland and a goal from johan wieser yeah um erling Haaland. i mean what, uh, i'm not even gonna speak about it now that's nine goals in four games for erling Haaland. what on earth i mean seriously this is mad and the, the thing about it is as well for the second goal he did the exact same finish which he did for the West Ham game which is just like oh my god he's, he's, he's even he's doing the same finish and they still can't stop it like it's mad and that second goal as well showed like oh it's just beautiful the way he peels off Binnick and then holds him off he like he goes ahead of him stops pushes Binnick aside him and, and then carries on beautiful beautiful and I mean, that's nine goals in four games. He probably could have got a hat trick, should have maybe got a hat trick. Um, honestly, I, I I think he might. He, I think he might do it. I think he might get the forty goal mark. I generally do. I generally generally do because he is unreal right now. But I mean, in terms of the actual game for silly, I thought this game was really really sort of showed why Man City are one of the best teams in the world because we all know passing out from a back Manchester City are arguably the best team in the world at doing so you know building from a back if you press 
Watkins and Duran. Like, I don't know who has a better than that. Like, Man City got rid of Alvarez now. You know, maybe, I don't know, Havertz and Jesus, potentially. Like, I, I, I don't know who's got better than that. Because John Duran, oh my word, he's just unreal in front of goal. So, so good. The depth for that is insane because he's even them. Your marks are coming off the bench combined for with Duran for that goal. And Bob, you got your assist as well. The depth they'll have is amazing. And it's a thoroughly deserved victory. And great, great win for them in terms of the mentality. As for Everton, you see, oh man, it, it's not necessarily the result. Losing away at Villa Park is perfectly fine. Losing 3-2 at Villa Park is actually pretty decent for Everton. But it's just a manner. It's a manner. It is. It's being 2 nil up again and losing 3-2. I mean, after what happened against Bournemouth, it's like, okay, so you clearly haven't learned your lesson. You clearly have not learned how to hold on to a lead. And the worrying thing is you can feel it coming. And I mean, some of the defending, like for the, for the Watkins first goal, how has Dinier got that much space? How has Watkins won a header over Michael Keane in the air? I mean... Just horrible, horrible defending. And then Calvert Lewin at, at 2 1 to Everton as a one on one completely messed up. I mean, this guy's awful at one on ones, I swear. And yeah, from that game, from that point on, you're like, yep, yeah, they're losing, they're losing. And they lose. Um, and I mean, this defense, that's three goals conceded again, three goals conceded versus Bournemouth, three goals conceded versus Brighton, four goals conceded versus Spurs. It's so worrying if you're an Everton fan because this is meant to be a team on Dutch that's built on a strong defence. And the defence is being tore open game after game. And then the mentality of these players, clearly, as I said, 2-0 up again. You're like, okay, it's happened against Bournemouth. Are you going to learn now how to manage the game? No, you're not. Yeah, so concerning if you're an Everton fan. I would be really, really worried. Really worried. Okay, next up. Uh, sorry, Manchester City, Chelsea, 1-0. Christopher Nkunku with the winner. Um, now, this game, as you can see, actually broke a record for the most cards given in a Premier League match. There was 14 yellow cards in this game. I mean, Anthony Taylor, jeez, man, this guy. Half of the cards, by the way, were for, like, such stupid reasons, like... For example, Sancho, there was a foul, I think, um, where is it, there was, there was like a foul by a Chelsea player, um, it was by Goldwell, not really a foul, but he gives it as a foul, Sancho runs over with his sort of hands in the air, goes to talk to the ref, and he just gives him a yellow stream, I'm like, oh my gosh, man, like, jeez, this guy was like, I'm, I'm convinced in the VR, they were like, oh, by the way, Anthony, you're, you're like three cards away from, um, breaking the record, just, just, just dish him out for no reason, uh, so he did that, but yeah, anyways, in terms of the actual game, uh, from a Bournemouth perspective, I mean, this was a really frustrating loss, I thought Bournemouth deserved at least a point, they arguably deserved to win the game, they had some good opportunities in this game, Tavernier hit the bar, um, and Sanchez made some good saves, but of course, Evan Nielsen had a penalty, in this game, which was saved by Sanchez. Now, it actually wasn't like a abysmal penalty. It was a pretty decent save by Sanchez. But that's like one of the worst, worst um, scenarios really for Bournemouth. I mean, Evan Nielsen, the new signing, cost all that money. Um, you know, it's about, okay, get your first goal under your belt. That's really what you want. Just alien, alien. I don't know. Ely of eight, there you go. Eight, is that how you say it? I don't know. <laughs> um, get rid of the pressure on your shoulders for that first goal. You get a penalty, best chance to do it, and now you've missed. Will that play into him? Is it going to eat away his confidence? I don't know. Hopefully not for his sake and Bournemouth, but yeah, it's not good. It's not good. But as I said, I thought Bournemouth's performance overall was really good. They caused us all sorts of problems down their left hand side with Cliver and Davenir linking up. I thought Marcus Sanesi was absolutely unreal in this game. They did some really good pressing at points. Um, 
he saw Anthony Taylor's performance from the night before and he was like, I, I gotta top that. So he brandished the most yellow cards we've seen in the first half. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty funny. But anyway, from a Spurs perspective, God, you're gonna be so frustrated. I mean, set pieces again. Like, set, Spurs are awful at defending corners. They are so bad. It's been their Achilles heel last year and it's like their Achilles heel again. I could almost guarantee Arsenal were gonna score from a set piece and they did it again against Spurs. Poor defending for it again. Romero gets bullied far too easily. You know, um, the guys blocking um, the Arsenal players are sort of ahead of Vicario and it's, at that point it's the job of the Spurs players to push them away so that Vicario can claim that, but they don't do it. And yeah, it's, it's really poor from Spurs. Really, really poor. Um, and yeah, they, they, they created some chances. They had a couple of decent ones. They couldn't really take them both. It reminded me a lot of the Newcastle game where Spurs had all of the ball. Their opposition were camped in their own half. But Spurs were passing it around, got into some decent positions. And then that final third, that final ball, just everything broke down. They couldn't really be decisive when they did get those chances. They didn't take them as well. And then on the counter, they got caught out a couple of times. Gabriel Martinelli, you know, got in a free few times. Um, and then, yeah, lapse of concentration for another goal was conceded. Like, yeah, really, really worrying. I will say Dominic Solanke looked pretty good. Dominic Solanke looked pretty decent. I, I was impressed with him. But overall, for Spurs, it's just so frustrating. This is a real opportunity to at least get a draw. But they could have won that. They really could have won that game. But they were just so indecisive, so poor in the final third. Struggled to really break down Arsenal and then all four set pieces yet again. Okay, and the final game we've got is Wolves 1, Newcastle 2. Got some Mario Lamina, Fabian Scher, and Harvey Barnes. Now, I mean, this game had two of the best goals of the weekend. Fabian Scher's goal, I mean, it did take a little bit of a deflection from Dawson, but still. And then Harvey Barnes were an absolute build. I mean, that one was clean. I mean, if you're Gosh, that is so frustrating. That because they, you see, Newcastle were on top for the first like 20 25 minutes, they were controlling the game, creating some chances. Gordon, I think, hit the bar, and Wolves didn't look great. But then suddenly, they get that goal, and then after that, Wolves were really comfortable. They were really, really comfortable. Newcastle had a couple chances here and there, but nothing really too dangerous. Wolves looked pretty good, pretty safe. And looked like they were going to get the three points. At the very least, a draw. Then suddenly, a Fabian Share screamer. And then suddenly, a, a Harvey Barnes screamer. And, and you've lost the game. It's like, if you carry O'Neill, I'm sure he's like, you know, there's nothing I can really do about that. It is what it is. Um, but as I said, I thought this Wolves performance was probably their best of the season. I think it really was. I thought they were really, really solid. That goal, by the way, was beautiful. It was beautiful. It wasn't like a screamer like that, but uh, the play from Shawko Strong Larson absolutely bullied Dan Burn. So strong, so physical Strong Larson, fantastic. Cuts it back, Schwal Gomez with the little dummy. It's, oh, it's absolutely exquisite. And then Lamina with the dabbing. Love it, love it, love it. A couple of the new boys played as well. Andre looked pretty decent in midfield. Uh, Forbes, Carlos Forbes came off a bench. A couple of minutes actually looked pretty decent, I thought. But yeah, yeah, if you're Wolves, as I said, this was probably your best performance of the season. You've been undone by some wonder goals. I would be really frustrated, but you didn't get any points because you definitely deserved it. But I would, I would be encouraged by the performance. I would be encouraged by the performance. But I would just be so annoyed at the way you lost. And as for Newcastle, I mean, they didn't really deserve to win this game. They maybe just about deserved to get a point. But they got the win, and that is huge. That is huge. You know, that's something I said about Arsenal. That's something I've said about Chelsea. So, you know, it's a sign of a good team when you're not playing great and you get the job done. That's all that matters, really. And that's sort of something that Newcastle, Newcastle have been doing so far this season. You know, against Spurs, weren't amazing, got the win. Southampton weren't amazing, got the win. Bournemouth weren't amazing, got a draw. Wolves weren't amazing, got a win. Newcastle are really starting to master the art of not playing well and, and getting wins, getting it done, um, which is really, really good, I guess. Did get a bit fortunate with some of the goals being so good, but still. Alexander 
Isaac did come off at half time. I would assume it was an injury. I would assume it was an injury, um, which would be concerning if you're a Newcastle fan. But yeah, Newcastle, good result, good result, given given um, how, how poor they played. Wolves will be so frustrated. All right, time for time for the awards. Um, so my player of the week this week. Uh, obviously, I could go Erling Haaland, but that's a bit boring. Could go Hudson Adoy, Jaden Sancho, Gabriel, but I'm gonna go for John Duran. John Duran with an absolute screamer to win it for Villa against Everton. Complete the comeback. Absolutely incredible. My flop of the week, a flop of the week, um, I could go the entire Everton team again, like it's last week. Or I could go Calvert Lewin, but I missed 1 1 1 v 1. But I'm going to go Evan Nielsen. A little bit harsh, but it's a penalty. 0 0. You score that, you go 1 0 up, Bournemouth probably get at least a draw from that game. You missed, and yeah, Chelsea go ahead and win that game. The words refereeing decision. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go for Anthony Taylor's performance and that, uh, giving that many cards is crazy. Um, and then the moment of the week, the moment of the week, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go for um, so the Nottingham Forest Liverpool game. I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but Nuno's post-match interview, um, like you can just hear the Forest music just blasting, it's absolutely great. And it reminded me of the Palace one last season where Klopp's doing his, um, his post-match interview and then there's just Lil Uzi blasting. It's so funny. It just reminded me of that moment. Like, it wasn't as funny because, of course, it was Nuno there. Um, but it just reminded me of that funny moment from last season. Um, and, like, seeing all the memes about it and, like, Will Hughes and that. It, it, it's hilarious. It just reminded me of that. But, yeah, that, that, that was pretty funny. I like that moment. But, yeah. That is the Game Week review, Game Week 4 review done. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on all of the games discussed. And if you have enjoyed this video, please leave a like, consider subscribing.